and uh, just give the acts as much love and energy as possible because we eat that up. <laughs> we need a lot of validation, that's why we do comedy. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have a quick uh, clap and cheer off. So I'm going to say uh, this half of the room is going to, you're going to be the cheerers. Are you ready for that? Yeah. Yeah. And this half of the room are going to be the clappers. So I'd like the clappers to start off as just a golf clap. Just like, oh, quite nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And maybe, oh, actually, that was a bit impressive. We'll take it off. <laughs> gig I've ever done. <laughs> Smallest was in Adelaide. I had two old ladies. Um, not too bad though. That was the whole population of Adelaide. Uh, this is also a much better gig than the one I was doing last night where a bunch of boomers uh, had come in from the country and as they were about to announce me I'm like waiting there standing up getting ready and he spent a whole minute staring at me like in disbelief like surely not <laughs> like and then I just imagine him going home and thinking like now I've seen everything now <laughs> uh, I like traveling anyone a uh, fan of traveling here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, everyone's in Europe at the moment I'm like Ugh, itching to be there <laughs> the last time I went uh, I was uh, spending some time in Amsterdam and uh, I was in an ice bar, I met a girl there and I was chatting to her, I was like, where are you from? And she said, oh, I'm from China. And I was like, oh, you're Chinese, no way, I'm Chinese. And then I said something that surprised even myself. I said, but your English is so good. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, have you ever felt so Australian? This is a question. <laughs> Any cultural people out there? Do you, have you ever felt so Australian that you accidentally do a 360 and become a full blown racist? <laughs> uh, I do get mistaken for people. I'm not. I don't have a doppelganger. I'm not famous, but people always come up to me thinking that uh, I've met them somewhere. They're my friend. This guy stopped me in the street. And he's like Jane. I'm like, mm mm. Like, yeah, yeah, you're Jane. You write articles for the Age. Like, what did he expect me to say in that moment? Like, oh, sorry, he totally forgot. <laughs> I am Jane. Uh, my uh, true fact about myself, my name's Annie, but I have a sister named Anna. It's not a joke. Um, yeah, my parents were not the smartest people. They never got through page one of the baby naming book. <laughs> Um, my mum, uh, she is a very nice lady, I talk about her a lot in my stand-up and she's done a lot of nice things for me. For example, she taught me how to drive. She didn't have a license. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like to describe myself as Chinese and Australian. I feel like a combination of both. And a perfect example of that is when I saw my mum eating a meat pie with chopsticks. <laughs> <That's super talented. laughs> but there, there does come like a moment in your life when you realise your parents are not as smart as you thought they were. Like they don't know everything about the world. Uh, it all came crashing down for me when my dad, uh, I was about nine years old, he got his finger stuck in a wet wipes container and <laughs> we had to go to the pharmacy to <laughs> Any single people here today? Woo! Woo! Just yeah. one. Yes. Are you all in relationships? No. <laughs> Where's that cheering we're talking about? <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I'm reflecting a lot on like my relationships. I've been single now for like six months and it's like yeah, pretty long period. I think it's probably like one of the longest of me being single and like yeah, I think I'm pretty happy. I'm happy about that because like the first relationship I had, the guy broke up with me. Uh, the day before my wisdom teeth surgery. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't think anyone in this room will ever know what it's like to have your heart and your teeth ripped out! <laughs> um, but, you know, 
No, I think it was for the best. Like, we're very different people. Uh, for example, like, my worst fear is heights. Meanwhile, his worst fear was that people were jerking off into the public hand soap in bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, jizz soap was one of his worst fears. Um, crazy for news. And, <laughs> and then there was a time. Then there was a time he put his arms around the wrong Asian girl at a party. Oh, oh my god. god. There's, there's no punchline to that joke. <laughs> it's simply group therapy for me. <laughs> um, and I remember like we broke up uh, after my dad passed away. It was like kind of around the same time. And because like I'm a Gemini, I'm a very dramatic person about all things. So I remember distinctly saying during that breakup, like, well, now all the men in my life are either dead or gone. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then like six months ago, uh, my recent boyfriend broke up with me on the night of my comedy festival opening. <gasps> yeah, so it was all like really hectic and one of the things that I'm still shocked about was that he said one of the reasons we, why we had to break up was that I don't play golf. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, but I believe that is my greatest asset. <laughs> uh, uh, and this year, because I've been single, I've been able to do a lot more volunteering and giving back to the community. Like, I went on this big charity ride, and originally I was going to do it with my ex, and I invited him, and when I said, like, the date was getting closer and closer, and I said, like, so are you coming to this ride with me in August? And his response to that, I'll never forget, he said, for us, there won't be an August. Oh. I'm like, so yeah, somehow I initiated the breakup. I'm like, how? It's so intense. Like finding out that a month of the year does not exist. Like that is like my January, February, March, April, May, June, July. See you in September. Um, yeah, we, we made it. Uh, we are here. It's okay. Um, yeah, so I've been going on some dates and not all of them have gone well. One particularly <laughs> bad date I went on was with a guy who kept calling the date a rendezvous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that kind of gentleman, yeah. And um, we're talking about hobbies and I was saying I volunteer at the LGBTI radio station, Joy 94.9, and he's, he asked me a question, he's like, but you're not of that persuasion, are you? <laughs> And I was like, no, but you have persuaded me that you're a fucking dick. <laughs> uh, the worst part of that date was that he said he was really smart and he knew the digits of pi to a ridiculous amount. And he was like, test me, test me. And I'm like, mm, I really don't want to. And he was like, come on. So I pulled out my phone and I Googled it. And uh, he only got to 10 digits. That's not very impressive, mm. is it? Like, that's the same amount as a phone number. <laughs> <laughs> and like, he does not know this, but I went to a select entry school, like the top school in the state, so of course, like, I also know the digits of pi. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can test me. You wanna test me? Yes! yes. Um, it is 3.14019005A2. <laughs> Just kidding, that's my phone number! <laughs> Like she's not getting it. <laughs> this is also being recorded, so I'm like, guess my numbers out there now. <laughs> That's okay as well. Uh, the other crazy thing is, I started, I signed up to do a celebrancy course, Cert Four in celebrancy, before I had this breakup. So now I'm heartbroken and having to learn all about love and how to like oh. make a wedding go well. Um, yeah, but every time I tell my friends like I'm, I'm doing a celebrancy course, they keep thinking I've said celibacy. <laughs> and one friend like jumped in, she's like, oh my god, are you doing a dick talks? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I actually am, but not by choice. <laughs> and like to make a marriage legal, legally binding, you have to use special language. And one of the words you use a lot is Solemnize, which I sounds a lot like another word, which is not as legal. Um, and I know I'm gonna fuck it up one day. Like any one of these days, I am going to accidentally sodomize someone's marriage. <laughs> but when you think about it, that is actually the secret to a long-lasting marriage, isn't it? Just a little bit of anal, a little bit. <laughs> it's not too much. It does feel like it's too early for this. <laughs> Not my usual, um, yeah, routine. Um. <laughs>
how much time? Oh, I've done like about eight minutes. Okay, I'll give you some more stuff then. Um, <laughs> yeah, I. Well, oh yeah, I used to work an office job, so back in the day, it, this would have been perfectly normal um, for me to be out at this time. Who works an office job? Give me a cheer. Woo! 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 woo. woo. Yes! Um, yeah, I used to work for government, and I miss it, because that's where material used to rain down from the ceiling, straight into <laughs> my pocket. It was so good. Um, like, the last day of work, like, I overheard this girl chatting in the corridor, and she was asking someone else, Is a lemon? a type of melon. <laughs> That's good. And the other person in the conversation said, no Hayley, it's a lemon. <laughs> and the same chick Hayley, the first day I started, she was across the office like screaming out, like, oh my god, this coffee literally tastes like shit. <laughs> was like, literally? <laughs> she kept pushing it. She was like, yeah, yeah, it literally tastes like somebody sat on my face oh. and shat in my mouth. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, she meant literally. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what got me thinking. Have you ever felt like you're literally too smart to have a job? <laughs> I worked a lot of other shitty jobs before. I used to work in hospitality. It was about four years of my life. Any hospo peeps? Anyone mm. worked in hospo? Yeah, where do you work? Spot bar. Spot bar, that's yeah. a good place to work, isn't it? It's around yeah. like tables all day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody did ask me like, what's your favorite vegetable? And I was like, you know, you have to separate that between like frequently, most frequently eaten and like favorite. Cause they're two different right. things, right? Mm. I'm just going on. I'm just having a chat with you now. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you Celery. Celery. Yeah. Ooh, Ooh. Controversial. That is like mostly water. So your favorite. <laughs> yeah, you don't care. You burn more calories chewing the celery than it like, provides. Yeah. Um, but somebody did tell me, like my friends, like, but potatoes don't count. You can never choose potato as your favorite vegetable because it's too delicious. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. Mm, yes. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> good, good tape chat. Uh, where was that? Anyway, I used to, yeah, I used to work in hospitality and um, I worked at a hotel and we would do catering for events and I remember the worst shift I ever had. Hands down worst shift. A girl threw up at, at the table while we were serving dessert. Yeah. And everyone else was so off their face they just ate around her. <laughs> Yeah, but it doesn't compare to my sister's experiences because she worked at the Maccas on the corner of Flinders and Elizabeth Street. Oh. Yeah, the worst. yeah, I was like, oh, what's the worst shift you've ever had? And she was like, hmm, well, one time I had to clean feces out of the bathroom sink. With my hands. And I was like, how do you do it, man? How do you do it? And she said, it's very simple. You put on the gloves, you start scrubbing, and then soon enough, your soul leaves your body. <laughs> cheering again, our favourite thing! Yeah. Hi everyone, thanks for, coming, thanks for coming out to see comedy in the morning. <laughs> I understand your pain being out here. Normally I haven't left the lovely haven of my bed by this time of day. There's reasons why I chose a comedy lifestyle. Um, <laughs> So I, I really appreciate you've made this sacrifice to give up <laughs> on your sleep to come out and see me do comedy. Um, because I love sleeping. I love sleeping. It's like, I, I hate that separation in the morning when I am not, like, you know, you get disturbed from sleep. Mm. Does anyone here like their alarm clock? Mm. Oh, yeah. What? No, I mean, it's like tough crowd. <laughs> um, no, I, I hate being disturbed by my alarm clock um, in the morning. Like, sleep. To me, it's like this magical world, and then there's like, you know, coming to the end of it, it's like reaching the end of a favourite series. Mm -hmm. It's like when, remember any Harry Potter fans in? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, like remember how it felt when you got to the end of Deathly Hallows? Mm. And I was just like, oh, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's over and there, there's no more. <laughs> and it doesn't matter like how much of it you've had. Uh, um, you might have had too much of this thing. Um, recently, you still want more of it. Um, and like sleep for me, that's like the magical world of Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, the waking up world, that's... Um, but that's more like the bleak reality of J.K. Rowling's subsequent Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do love, I do love Harry Potter. My favourite was Dumbledore. Do you remember, like, him? Yeah. <laughs> I love because he was so true wizard, right? Like, I like how it's like just after the books, he just magically became gay. For the sound, I was like, oh, well done. And then when a movie came out, his gay just just magically disappeared. Um, he was, he was fabulous. But um. That, like with talking about my alarm clock and stuff, there is one thing I like about it, which is the snooze button. <laughs> I enjoy the snooze button. I think more stuff had to have to fuck off for ten minutes. <laughs> and then again, and ten minutes later, if, when they come back, it's like, no, still no baby. <laughs> anyway, look, speaking of me, um, I want to do a poem now. Uh, a love poem. Um, so it's called Asexual. Um, it's a good poem. <laughs> you know, you're gonna really enjoy it. Okay. Like we've had a, I've had a few chapters about like, is this gonna make you feel things? This poem's gonna make you feel a lot of things. Like this poem's gonna blow your mind. <laughs> oh my god! Why she did what? Oh my god! This poem, like it, it's crazy. I mean, I know not this part. Obviously, this is the introduction part. <laughs> But we haven't got into the poem yet, but when we get there, when we get through the, these early stages, we'll get there and it'll be amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, wow, okay, you're gonna love it. I promise you, like, you're looking at me like you don't believe me, <laughs> but this poem is gonna rock your world. So I'm, I'm a little bit nervous, which is probably, like, I think that's getting in the way, like, sort of, you know, I'm here, like, doing a, a, a poem presentation. Like in a university, it's like a different environment. I know it's, you're probably nervous too, you don't know who I am. You're like, oh, do I trust this girl's poem? Like, I know, it's like, it's fine, we'll work through the nerves. You'll get to the poetry and it'll be. It'll be lovely, you'll love it. Sorry, maybe I'm doing this wrong. Maybe I should just change position here. Hang on, maybe if I go. Maybe if I'm like, maybe if I'm back here. Look, maybe if I do it faster, maybe if I do it faster and more passionately, does that work? Does that help? If I give it a bit of speed, if I throw some words at it? Maybe if I do it slower, softer, more gently. Have we achieved poetry yet? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I know this poem's probably feeling pretty disappointing <laughs> to you right now. It's probably not lived up to what I promise from it, but I promise you it does get good. Just keep listening to it and it will become a good poem. You will enjoy this poem and if you're not going to enjoy this poem then maybe you're just not listening to the poetry right. Maybe you need to be listening better. Sorry, I'm being harsh, Anna. That was very rude. You've probably had a bad experience with poetry. <laughs> You've probably been traumatised by the Bush Poetry Night. Uh, like a haiku where the syllables are all wrong. I, I shouldn't... I can make you enjoy this poem. I can make you enjoy this poem. I will make you enjoy this poem. And if you won't enjoy this poem, then maybe the problem is with you. Maybe it's your ears. Your ears are just frigid. Your, your ears are just fucked up. It's a problem with you. I promise you the poem is good and you will enjoy it and I will make you enjoy it whatever I do. It'll happen. Just wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. It'll happen. <laughs> Um, 
that was, yeah, that is asexual love poem. It's a poem about being asexual, um, about my experience with, with, with sex. So I do talk a lot about my identity when, when doing um, performance. I got into comedy to talk about asexuality. That's how it came out. It just felt awkward to talk to people about it. So I'm just like, I'll just put a show <laughs> with an asexual pun in the title. Uh, and then people come and they've signed on for an hour and hearing what all about. <laughs> Um, but no, I don't, like, I don't, uh, I don't do the sex, it's not a thing I do. I've done the sex, I've done the sex, but look, given choice between having sex and, like, say, a moderately decent brunch, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go to brunch. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand why people want to have sex in beds at all. Like, why would you want a perfectly good sleeping spot <laughs> <laughs> by introducing physical activity? <laughs> Um, so I do do a lot of comedy about, I do a lot of comedy talking about, you know, my love of sleeping in and my love of animals. I do a lot of animal comedy, because animals are great, aren't they? Yes. Yes. Animal fans here? Yes! yes. Any, like, particular like, cat people? Yes! One. Uh, so dog people then? Woo! Some of you haven't put your hands up, like, you like horse people? <laughs> Parrot people? And a pet lamb. A pet lamb! Who's best, like, any animal will do, as long as I have to have a conversation with another fucking human being? Like, because animals are better, aren't they? Yeah. They, they are better. Um, we, know, we know they're better, because we put up with shit for animals which we would not put up with. <laughs> from other people. Could you imagine, like, dating a guy who lounges around your house the way your cat does? <laughs> and it's just like... It's there in the morning when you go out, it's there in the evening when you come out, just like, meh, feed me. Like, <laughs> you would not accept that. Can you imagine, like, a, like, a guy who behaves like a dog? Like, imagine that I like, just go out for a walk and then he just, like, stops and takes a crap on the pavement. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what I would do in that situation. I don't know how I would do it, but I know what I'm not doing. I'm not like, uh -huh, I'll get it. <laughs> I like, you know, like how dogs are so, so easily amused? Uh, like, I'll come around with a ball and you throw the ball and I keep bringing it back. And it's like, imagine, imagine talking to someone who was like that, like that easily amused by something. It's like, Gary, I'm sick of hearing that you're freaking red ball. Like, <laughs> actually, you don't, you don't need to imagine that. You just need to get like a young straight white guy talking to <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, he privatised the space industry. Oh, that's. <laughs> oh, well, here it comes. It's coming back. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Oh, well. Wow. Oh, he's dating Grimes. Oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, he's um, yeah, he believes the whole world universe is a simulation. That's fucking fascinating. <laughs> that's gonna come back to me again, isn't it? <laughs> I, I do love. Um, I do love talking about things like, like animals and, and sleeping in and stuff, but there is always a pressure like by being a queer lady when I get up and say, people want to hear about the queer. <laughs> like I get up and I'll be doing this thing like, oh, how create a cat videos on the internet. <laughs> when I was young, like if you wanted a cat video, you had to like get a cat. And, <laughs> and I'll do that to the material and people will be like, why is this trans girl talking about something that's not being trans? <laughs> Why is she talking about cats? When does like when does this tie into when does this tie into your pain? <laughs> Especially when you do poetry, because people really want the poets. They need pain. They don't like it being lighthearted. To me, they're like no 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 no. They're like the Dementors from Harry Potter, just like swing berets instead of like hoods, and so they feed off your pain. Um, <laughs> But I don't, I don't always like to do that. I prefer to be a bit lighthearted. But I would like to give you another poem. Woo! And this is one, it's a meat break for the poetry market. So it's got, it's got a little bit of pain in there. Because I don't really like it. I don't really like it. It is for estrogen. Well, well not yet. <laughs> At the moment, E is for like, extremely long weight. Because F is for fear. G is for the girlfriend who you love, but with whom it just doesn't feel quite right. For the gay clubs which you go to and feel out of place all night. It's for the gym with which you destroy your body and the gym with which you obliviate your mind. For the God who will not answer the prayers. H 
It's through the horror show which her body becomes day by day. The hair. The hair. The hair. I, in sweet introspection, gotta sort some shit out. It's for investigation, gotta look some shit up. It's for isolation, gotta do the hard shit. Jay's for <laughs> just Jake's. Anytime you accidentally give yourself away. K is for the kicking that your ass is gonna get given anyway. K for the knuckles they use to scourge the prettiness from your fa your face. K, foolish girl, is for knowing the facts. So L is for low profile. Let no one know. L is for a life sentence of losing hope. M is for... M is for... I can't even fucking say the word. I'm going to try to make this work as a... Could it be a... N is for not. N is for no more. N is for never too late. N is for not impossible. One day... Is for now. O oh, is for estrogen. <laughs> That's how we spell it in Australia. It's actually like it took us longer to get there than we thought, just because how Australia is. <laughs> but we did get there. And O is for estrogen, and P is for pride, and Q is for queer community, and R is for the rainbow flag of your people, S is for supportive friends, and T is for trans is beautiful. And you is for unbelievable relief and unimaginable joy and uh, underwhelming response from parents. <laughs> <laughs> but who cares because you is for unreal. V is for vagina. <laughs> I mean, it will be because V is also for very expensive. <laughs> but W is for womanhood, which is not defined by any part of your body or by a letter on a certificate, but by your heart. X is for, oh, well, I mean, like, whatever you want X to be for. <laughs> X can be for Zizer pronouns, if you like. Because you write the rules now. Because Y is for you. Finally, something is for you. Now Z is to zzz, because this has been one hell of a journey, and girl, you have earned a nap. <laughs> Facebook at the moment from the socials, um, particularly uh, because of one of my favourite things, uh, which is uh, unsolicited health and wellbeing advice. <laughs> uh, I find, uh, yeah, it's been quite intrusive to my mental health. Um, for example, uh, recently I've been getting um, a lot of advertising uh, for weight loss. Um, and also, in particular, um, on the flip side, uh, for Spanx. <laughs> tummy tummy <laughs> Spanx. Yeah. Um, you know, and we all know that Google's listening. Yeah. But uh, in this case, uh, that, that conversation wasn't for you, Google. Uh, that was for me. Uh, that was between me and my tear soaked pillow. Yeah. <laughs> um, not for you. Um, <clears throat> you know, I. I think, and it really does. I think it really does intrude uh, on our lives in some pretty, in some pretty harsh ways. Uh, our use of social media, um, and particularly, you know, I talk about unsolicited health advice. Uh, of course, there's also, um, you know, mental health advice. 
comments that we that we often get or, or messages about mental health and I think we are moving forward generally speaking um, you know in our in the social movement you know towards uh, better access to mental health and better understanding of mental health conditions um, but there's still some backwards views, you know. Uh, you might have seen that meme um, of the of the of the pills. There's the nasty, evil pills, and then on the other side, there's a lush green forest with a river running through. And and under the pills, the nasty, evil pills, um, there is uh, a caption, and it says, uh, "This is not an antidepressant." <laughs> under the <laughs> forest, <laughs> this is an antidepressant. <coughs> which I just don't find that convincing. Um, it would be a lot more convincing to me if that was an image of the title page of the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> that to me would be a more effective antidepressant. Um, look, in saying that, I, I, still, I still do get very anxious even, even when I block Facebook out, you know, even when I um, find a way to uh, curb some of these triggers that I experience. Um, but it all always manages to filter into my life, you know, my body image especially. Um, and uh, I suppose I've, I've got a bit of a song that kind of exemplifies that a bit about the way that these messages uh, affect how I how I think and feel about my body. start to move your hand towards my boobs up until now I was just fine felt like a porn star in your bed but there are things that you don't know that you can't see about me that only serve to fill me up with dread one boobs a little bit bigger Um, I'm very 
grateful to be here today. Uh, and um, the wonderful Elizabeth Davy, who invited uh, Nikki and uh, Annie and myself here today, we talked a little bit about um, what what kind of uh, message we wanted to kind of put forward today, um, what sort of tone we wanted to take, because there's a lot to be angry about um, for, for folks that are um, femme and non-binary and uh, it's it's, um, there's a lot of work still to do and there's a lot to be angry about, but uh, I think something that's uh, come up time and time again for me is this idea of uh, holding each other up. Um, because uh, you don't realise how insidious it is, um, how, uh, how often we, the, the competitiveness, I guess, between, between women kind of comes out. And it's, it is ingrained and it's, it's that ingrained misogyny uh, in, in us all that we have to kind of constantly fight against. Um, in my introduction, Elizabeth mentioned uh, I um, play in a duo called Pink Flappy Bits. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in our in our last show, um, we had a song uh, that was very much on this topic about uh, women uh, pitted against women, and it's something um, that is very uh, it's very important to me to to uh, to, to challenge that. Um, and um, this particular song we sang uh, in our last show, which was two of us, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, <laughs> we're doing a bit of a Velma Kelly here. Um, and, uh, but, but it was specifically about that. Um, and it was essentially a song that began with the two of us in a bit of a screaming match, in you know, a catch fight. Uh, and we just went for the jugular. And at the time when we were writing it, it was very much um, things that were true. So at the time, uh, my, my comedy partner Lou was on her third degree, she hadn't quite finished yet. Uh, I myself was in, uh, just came out of a really awful relationship um, and uh, was a bit of a, I guess we'd say a, um, I'm not going to say a failed rock star, but an attempted rock star. Um, <laughs> now I'm in comedy. <laughs> Um, yeah. But anyway, so we'd start with these scathing, uh, these scathing insults, and they were right at they were right at the jugular, they were right at the throat, and uh, when it got to the chorus, it kind of hit home exactly what was going on, you know. misogyny and it's what holds women back 
And when they're not holding each other up, they're holding each other back. And so then I'd launch into our, uh, our war cry, <laughs> which went a bit something like this. And I encouraged the crowd to sing along so we could throw off these shackles of internalized misogyny. So I'll ask you to repeat after me. costumes that I've gone interacting to get. <laughs> um, so I sort of dropped out, but I had, I did become a theatre critic and a comedy critic. Oh, before that, I just became obsessed with comedy festival. I moved to Melbourne, <laughs> and I just started, like, I, I was like a comedy festival hustler. Like, seriously, I would go around, because I couldn't afford all the shows I wanted to see, so I'd just go around hustling comedians for free tickets. <laughs> um, and I became an expert at this, like getting um, free and cheap and whatever tickets into shows. And so every year at comedy festival time, I would just see comedy and see comedy and see comedy. Um, and I'd have these dreams about these comedy shows which I wanted to write one day, which would just be like, that's whatever was going on in my life at the time, just put on a poster. <laughs> and um, so I used to dream, dream about it, but I didn't think I'd actually do it. I didn't really get the, the confidence to do it. But I did because um, there's only so long you can work that hustle for before it gets tiring. So I became a critic so I could see shows for free um, and write about them. So I was a comedy critic. Um, and then what actually got me over the line into comedy, kind of embarrassingly and unusually, um, with my sexuality, it was a boy. Um, I had a, there was a boy I had a bit of a crush on, um, it's like, well, a squish, that's what we call it, and, and um, uh, as people would refer to them as squishes, like a crush, but it's like a softer. Um, anyway, he was, like, he was a hot boy who I liked being around and he was doing improv, so I was just like, ah, oh, 
maybe, I know out there he does classes, maybe I'll just turn up there and be walking past the improv school and I'll be like, oh, hi, you're here. <laughs> um, so I did that and I turned up and he wasn't there. <coughs> but there were all these people hanging around and the improv school was just in the middle of nowhere. And <laughs> it's like, oh, um, is this where the improv happens? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, can I do it? And they're like, well, normally people like, enroll first, but okay, sure. <laughs> Uh, so I started doing improv, um, and sorry, this story's gone on for a while, but I, uh, so I started doing improv, which was just like we just used to do like these shows in a pub every week, um, and it didn't feel like it was going to be a career thing or anything, it was just like, oh, here's a fun thing to do, to be vaguely near a hot tournament, um, and I, um, I forgot all about him within, so I could go obsessed with improv, um, but, so I was doing that, we perform every week, doing improv and then we started doing by stand up out of that and then eventually that moved into me doing when it was time to come out to the improv community that's when I went the first solo show um, and I performed that and it was it was under a tight timeline because I wanted to talk about all this pre-transition stuff but I was like I'm a, like on hormones it's like well this needs to happen now it needs to happen in this festival or it's not happening at all <laughs> <laughs> so that pushed me to do my first solo and um, I've been doing it ever since. Amazing thank you so much. And, um, that's, um, yes. Uh, what's your origin story? Origin, yeah, you're cool. Um, so I grew up in a theatre family, um, music, uh, like children's theatre. Um, so my childhood was spent uh, flitting around in fairy costumes or mouse costumes or <laughs> uh, pirate costumes uh, or a combination. Um, and uh, so I, I really had kind of theatre in my blood growing up um, and also music. So my mum uh, is a playwright and my dad's a children's songwriter. Um, and uh, so I had, I, I basically started with music, so, um, and theatre, so up through high school I did a lot of, um, I was in a lot of bands, uh, I recorded and I um, had, was like working a little uh, like a boutique label for a while um, and then got incredibly uh, disillusioned and jaded far too early uh, by age 17, 18 uh, with what was very obviously like it's a given that it's male dominated but uh, the way that that kind of comes through relates actually a lot to the second song I did today in terms of the way that I was so overwhelmed with competition for other other young women who were also kind of um, poised in the same category as me as like solo singer songwriters and that kind of thing and I got really bummed out by uh, just just not it just kind of ate away at me a bit and I, I, I decided to go, uh, so I, I actually left partway through BCE and then I went back and did year 12 at an adult college um, and then uh, I was still playing in bands but um, comedy wasn't even on my radar <laughs> at that point um, and then I got into Monash uh, to do arts and uh, at Monash they have an incredible um, student theatre there, Monash Uni Student Theatre which um, is uh, I can't even describe, it's like, it's probably the best student theatre program in Australia. Um, and uh, it was there that I met my comedy collaborator, Lou Megleston, who was my other pink flappy bit. <laughs> um, and it had occurred to me that uh, once we started writing, that I'd actually been writing musical comedy for years. Um, I had made it my goal for, you know, friends and family members' birthdays from age 12 to you know, write, rather than give them a gift, was to write them a song. And most of the time, I would make it humorous because I couldn't really deal with like, you know, emotion. I couldn't deal with intimate emotions very easily, especially <laughs> if I was writing for a for a friend or family member. So I'd always make it light. Um, and my earliest memory of that was like a friend, a, six, a sweet sixteen that I'd written. Uh, we had a bit of a a, 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 <laughs> a dark dynamic, but basically I uh, was just writing a song about how my friend was in fact the spawn of Satan, and uh, <laughs> there was a whole narrative about it and all the evidence for for that in her life. Um, you know, so I'd actually been writing comedy for for years, but it really, really just I loved rock and I loved playing in bands, so I was still really pushing that until I was about 20, 21, um, and then. But when I found comedy and cabaret specifically, so I come from a little bit of a different space, so and it's kind of stand up, Nikki's improv background, um, and and but we all kind of came to comedy, um, so mine was yeah uh, more kind of cabaret and theatre. 
Um, so yeah, so when I was in at uni, I, I did my uh, first comedy festival show with Lou in 2016. Uh, we then did a follow up in Fringe. The next following year, we did the Flappaganza <laughs> for comedy festival. <laughs> and then this year, I yeah premiered my first solo show, which was Taranoia. Uh, and yeah, as soon as I finished, my, it took me five and a half years to get through my arts degree. <laughs> And I blame student theatre. Um, but uh, when I did, I was just, I was just, I was just at the, it was, I felt like I was at the starting line. I just had to get this degree done so that I could kind of launch myself out. So I've actually only been doing a solo comedy kind of semi to professionally for for a, about a year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the fun yeah. thing is great because that gave me a huge like up. It was my first. Oh fuck! Um, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was my first performance outside just doing solo. There you go. <coughs> And there's people I met doing the flap again who I work with now, and it's like, it was a really good thing. I think, I'm sure we're going to touch on this later, mm. but what I absolutely love about these wonderful uh, women, and also just kind of more broadly in our community, is that, is that what really drew me into it, which uh, was very different to what I'd experienced in the music industry, particularly in Melbourne, was the community aspect. Um, and the fact that people were constantly trying to be, bring people in, rather than push people out. Mm. So, I'm sure we'll talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually that kind of really, uh, it, so it sort of ties into my next question, but it also, yeah, we can also continue talking about it, because I don't, I don't really want to be like, oh, we'll just put this on the shelf, because <laughs> like, it's a great topic, I yeah. really want to keep talking about it. Um, so, uh, yeah, my next question was, well, as you've all said, you all came through other art forms yeah. as well, and you've done a lot of storytelling yeah. and other kinds of art, um, and what do you find that comedy offers you over those other art forms to sort of, you know, tell stories, express your identity, like find your voice. What, yeah, what do you think is unique about comedy in that respect? Like, mm. it offers you that you maybe don't get from other art forms. So we can have a sort of back and forth, like, we don't have to get another one. Yeah, because yeah. you do storytelling as well. Um, and a combination, combination yeah. of storytelling, poetry, stand-up, burlesque, improv, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what, yeah, I quintuple. <laughs> yeah. A quint a quintuple threat. Quintuple threat. <laughs> um, yeah, because I always thought that I was a bad storyteller. Like, I was like, oh, I'm no good. Like, everyone seems to be naturally good at it. And then one day I was like, who's been telling me that? Like, actually, it's just me. So I then, I, I switched. <laughs> around and I was like, actually, I'm great at storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> went out and started doing it and started like calling myself a storyteller and people are now like, oh, your stories are fantastic. But uh, it was always comedy first because I could easily make a room laugh um, as opposed to like saying something serious. So that always came quite easily. So storytelling was more of a challenge and I like comedy because you can just go pretty unprepared and test things out. Like if you have an idea, you can go out and do it that night, but with storytelling you kind of have to, your writing should be quite strong and maybe think about how you want to word it beginning, middle and end. But sometimes like some of the jokes I'm writing now are maybe more premises and they need some more time to flesh out to be funny, but you still get a laugh. But you'll know on the inside that it needs a bit more work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really we all know that feeling. Yeah. 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 Baby joke! Yeah, there's definitely an immediacy to comedy where you can just try something. You can be like, I have this idea, let's no one's gonna tell you you can't. Mm -hmm. Like it's not you don't have to audition, you don't have to find a script that works for you or a group of people like you literally do that I can a couple of people listening. Mm -hmm. Um is that is that your experience? Um yeah. if you would think about forms that you work with? It's the moment why I like <laughs> comedy. I, I one of the reasons why I, I like Listening to comedy and performing is that it gives you this conduit into another person's mind and how they work and who they are as a person. Um, so I love comedy for that personal connection and the fact that you have this connection with your audience which you don't get in other art forms, so like the theatre. Um, it's very, very direct. Um, but I really like about it that it is that immediate, that you can respond to stuff that's happening in the world now mm -hmm. and you can bring it to your comedy show. And if stuff changes in the world, you can change your show because you're in complete control of it. Mm -hmm. So you can have written a script one way uh, and then something changes in your life or in the greater world and you go on the next night and do a different mm -hmm. thing. 
um, so you can adapt to it. And that's like, especially having been in theatre a long time, you do a lot of plays which were written a long time ago. Um, I mean, I used to perform a lot of Shakespeare, so a really long time ago. Um, and while elements of them hold up, they don't, it's a very slow art form to respond to the, the world that we live in. Um, and comedy isn't like that, it's an agile art form which can respond immediately to things. And I think that's one of its, the most powerful things about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of my show that I did at Fringe last year, it was like a test. And I needed to make up time, so I just wrote a rap. And it, was <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty bad. Like, <laughs> the next year, which was this year, like I found a much better ending because I like, had been in New Zealand at the time that there were lots of visuals for um, what happened Christ. in Christchurch. Yeah. So um, suddenly I found this ending because I wanted to talk about that. And it was like the racism and like comparing that to my dad's experience mm -hmm. when he came to Australia. And I was like, oh, it's like the perfect ending, but it kind of needed something that was like front of people's minds to like really kind of drive it home. So yeah, I was like, that is so much better than the shitty rap I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I like that, the BBC of it. It's great. Yeah. Um, for me, I, uh, I think I was like, as a young person, despite having a lot of creative energy, I was quite um, passive to authority when I was younger. Um, I was very much like a quintessential, I hate the term, but teacher's pet in, in the sense that I con connected a lot more with adults than I did with young people, but at the same time had a, had a difficulty. Um, I'd also kind of assume a very sub Sub submissive kind of uh, attitude when, whenever, uh, you know, I had a lot of guilt uh, being, you know, I, I, I would hate to break rules essentially. And um, I found um, that I'd actually been um, suppressing a lot of things by the time I got to uni and I think that the combination of my arts degree and discovering cabaret and comedy um, actually was unleashed something really interesting in me, um, which was I suddenly was able to adopt a persona and a voice um, that was able to kind of um, respond to authority in a, in a way that I hadn't been able to in my kind of more authentic self. Um, and I think that for me, that's what I love about comedy is its ability to speak truth to power um, in a way that many art forms still are, are able to do, but it really, you know, particularly I adore, you know, satire and, um, and that kind of biting comedy that allows you to to, as, as Nikki was saying, um, at what, what, what Annie and Nikki were both saying, in terms of being able to address social issues and political issues, but at the end of the day, you're still being able to create a, a oneness with your audience that, um, that, that lets them move out of that space with a sense of maybe a bit of hope and levity that you might not get from more dramatic art forms, I suppose. Um, yeah, there's a catharsis in love. Yeah, yeah. There's a sense that you've kind of had a, created something together that you can walk away with and go out into the world with. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying that other art forms can't do that, but I think that that's what attracts me to comedy. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely. I think I found as well. I, I wonder if you'd agree with comedy. Um, the audience are a collaborator because if you know it, the show is created together, mm. I like you look into each other's eyes. Mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> There's so many times performing comedy where, like, I'll change what I'm doing because of the audience. Yeah. Mm. So if you come in there and you've got, like, I've got this set in my hot little hand, I'm going to do it, and you look at the audience like, they're not going to do this. Yeah. Mm. They want to come on this journey, so I'll do another journey. Um, and you make the thing that you're doing around the audience. Yeah. Um, yeah. There. And then, there, conversely, there are other times where an audience <coughs> is loving something, and it compels mm. it to far greater heights than you expected it could go. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's, they're amazing, those shows. <laughs> yeah, and you come out yeah. with jokes which weren't in it originally, but they yeah. come out on stage and... Because of that change. Because of that, yeah. yeah. Then there are the ones where you're five minutes in, and it's like, <coughs> we have 50 more minutes. <laughs> 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 they call it dying because it feels like <laughs> <laughs> um, Which kind of brings into <coughs> I wanted to ask you as well, like we've talked about all the great things about comedy and the things it offers as an art form, but do you think it has some shortcomings? Like um, as Hannah Gadsby said in her phenomenal show The Net, um, she, she explored the need for a punchline that sort of shortened and contracted the full story. She couldn't give the whole story because she had to make sure she released the tension. And sometimes <coughs> something is tense 
for a reason. Um, would you say that you find that in your, I guess, in your careers, in your practices as comedians? Um, in <coughs> Restricting in some ways because I do have to shorten like the truth. Um, but the interesting thing about like the fact that the net has come out has kind of limited like, the way that I can work because people keep comparing what I've done to the net and it's like actually this is like events, real life like tragic events have happened to me that I've turned it into comedy and that was like before I'd seen the net like that was just the style I was doing. Um, so it's like anything that has like that drop in a show now is like, oh, that's like Manette. Or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bad yeah. 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 yeah, like, yeah. Oh, no, I don't <laughs> uh, Yeah, and what was the question? Because I had something else. Oh, like just about the shortcomings. Are there yeah. shortcomings to comedy as an art form or a form of expression where you feel like there isn't as much? There's something you can't talk about or there's things that you can't do. Uh, yeah, a lot of people. Uh, I'm probably not happy with you discussing them on stage. So it's like, uh, at first I was like hesitant to like you know, bring up like my exes, and I'm like, oh, this is my story now. Like I, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's like you know they're not even to me like a, a real person anymore. Like you know, they're kind of like more like it's a gift that I can take on like a new journey. So like I'm not as long as you can. Uh, close the loop on that. Like if you have closure, you can talk about it. If it's still raw, mm. give it some more time. Mm. Yeah, so that people can see that you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> And you, you need to yeah. feel okay about yeah, yourself you on stage to do it. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. not therapy, that's just traumatising yeah. the audience. <laughs> 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 it's therapy, but it's actually not. Like yeah. You don't bring anything to stage which is still sort of a bleeding wound. Yeah. You bring a nice, like, healed over scar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 There's a story behind it. <laughs> yeah, like when you, sing, when you sing something which is really vulnerable on stage, it's usually something which was vulnerable a little while ago. Mm. Um, Excuse me, sorry. Um, when I was first working, my first job I worked with a drama tech, and that was her advice to me, was just like, take what was really raw and vulnerable last year, <laughs> and that's what you put on stage, not what's raw and vulnerable now. Um, so it means that you can produce something which is fresh and authentically vulnerable on stage, but it's not weakening you, it's not putting you in a position where you actually feel unsafe yourself on stage, mm. or putting the audience in, this, in a situation where they feel unsafe for you. Um, I think in terms of your ask about limitations of comedy. And I find I've worked in different styles of it and each form has its limitation. Um, like the like with improv for instance, the glorious thing about it is that it's collaborative and that everyone creates this thing and you create something you could never come up with yourself by all feeding off each other. The downside of it is that it's collaborative. <laughs> <laughs> That you can't control your message in it, and sometimes the shows will go in different parts, and you end up trying to ring. <laughs> yeah, and it can, you can be especially if, um, mm. if you're trying to save a show and make sure it's still a feminist, queer, positive, and you know, progressive show. That can be a real. You can it can feel like you know taking ten dogs for a walk. <laughs> Um, it, can, it can be a journey, um, and I find that each each format that I work in has strengths and limitations like that, which is part of why when I do my shows I mix them all up and I'll have like intro segments or poetry segments or dance bits like within the rest of the show, um, and trying to create something which is just me, not a form uh, like that. The, um, Oh, I had such a good point about this, <laughs> which I was going to say, talking about what the shortcomings. Yeah. Do you want to think? Shall I throw something in while you think about you it? Throw something in while I remember. Well, I was going to say, it. limitations of comedy is that everything's getting too PC. <laughs> <laughs> Can't talk about anything anymore. Mm -hmm. No, I, um, I, I, I. Do all hands in this voice now. Yeah, that's better. I. Um, I think it's so, it's so funny, um, I think comedy is actually now because, possibly because of voices like Hannah Gatsby, um, at, but so many other, like so many other people that are, that are kind of pushing the envelope in terms of how, how inclusive comedy can be, um, it's actually for me, from where I sit and my my privileged position as well, so I, I, I don't think this is everyone's view, but I think that there is a lot, um, 
there is a lot more that comedy can now be doing. Um, and I think that there, there are these voices that are like, it's becoming more constrictive or like, mm. Or you know censorship and oh, um, but in fact, what that's what the the movement towards inclusive and more inclusive comedy is doing is it's making more room for more people, yeah. um, and so I I agree in terms of an art form it's it's still there are still limitations as you say there are still limitations to how we can deliver stories because at the end of the day you still you still need a punchline um, there still needs to be that. Uh, that that resolution that leaves people with that relief after the tension, um, but at the same time, there are more tensions that can be <laughs> explored now um, nowadays because we're diverse. I say we, I mean like everyone that's working towards a more inclusive comedy. Um, there are more, there's more tension that we can explore, um, and I think comedy is probably more challenging now than it, than it ever has been. Um, yeah, that's what I think about. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <coughs> sorry, I'm sort of near a glass of water or something, I think, isn't he? Um, but that's it. Thanks, Adelaide. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, I, cause I, um, as a critic, having seen a lot of comedy, um, yeah, like what Hannah Gatsby said did with Nanette, it wasn't, it wasn't super new. Like, there's a lot of, a lot of comedy touches on that, mm. that trope and draws on reality, and especially, um, especially women's comedy and queer comedy has often been in that space. Um, Hannah did it very well, and I made a very successful show out of it. But when we talk about it, like this was a thing that nobody had done that came out of the blue, it's just like, no, this was just Melbourne queer women's comedy. Yeah, <laughs> this is, we were, um, uh, we all sort of worked in that that space. Um, what I thought, like, Simpson, you talked about the different tensions and mm. stuff in comedy, because I think, yeah, comedy definitely is diversifying, becoming more interesting like that. What I was going to say earlier about what I felt the limitation of it was, is that because, for me, all comedy must come from truth. I believe that comedy has to come from a true space, um, and everything I do on stage is true. Um, I even try to, as much as I can, avoid using even exaggeration uh, in stuff. Sometimes I'll simplify things, but I try to keep it as true to life as I can. The limitation is that a lot of people don't believe it because you're a performer <laughs> and you can get up and I will deliver the most honest, raw, from the heart, this is the most honest I've ever presented myself to anyone. This audience sees this that no one has ever seen in my personal life and I'll come off and people will be like, oh, I just love your onstage persona, like what a great character. I'm like, no, you get that's not a character, you get that's me. <laughs> And it can be a thing, especially with um, sort of my comedy is aimed at spreading awareness of queer identity and increasing audiences' understandings of queer identity. That there are always going to be audience members who only see it as a stage act. Mm. Um, and when I talk about being asexual, they'll think, oh, she's joking. That's a joke about sex. She likes it. Because we all like to joke about sex, right? But she probably likes it. It's like, no, it's not. It's actually very true, and people won't get that. And I get that a lot with, with being trans on stage as well, that because people see me in a performance context, um, and so they'll think of me as a drag queen. And I have fans who will come up to me, like, screaming and being super effusive, and then stand to me. Um, because they think that this, which is me, is a stage persona. Um, and that sort of, that problem with, like, doing truth through performance is that people will always see it through that filter of it being mm. a performance. And so sometimes it feels like I'm giving everything to this art, but it's, it's people still aren't, like, they're only going to take what they're going to take <laughs> from it. Um, and sometimes they don't take what you want them to or what you expect them to, and you're like, that's what you got from this show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. People will say like, oh, you're so different on stage. Like, oh, you're like a totally different person. Cause like I crank up the energy and I've been told like, your on stage persona is you, but cranked up 30%. So I try to do that. But yeah, I find that like, oh, but it's just me. Like I'm not a different person. Like I'm a whole person. It's just, I'm being a bit more amplified. So, cause in general, I don't think anyone can maintain that level of energy like throughout the day. Like you'd be really crazy. Like, you know, just saying like, <laughs> but <"Badum -chi."> like, <laughs> <laughs> but I feel most me on stage. Mm. That's when I feel like I'm most authentically mm. myself is on stage. I feel like as soon as you get out in the world and you've got to negotiate these other 
non-stage environments, that's when more sort of theatre comes mm. in. And you've got to play yeah. particular roles to get through your day. Mm. Whereas like, when you're on stage doing your shows, it's like, well, this is an hour of me, so you're just yeah. going to see all of it. This is my space, I don't need to negotiate with you to buy a train mm. ticket. <laughs> <laughs> leads into my next question which is great uh, which is do you think that there's been um, with that bringing yourself um, and you can bring your whole self to the stage and you can bring what's true and what's immediately on your mind all those things do you think that there are there are topics or there are things that um, comedy has given you a unique opportunity to discuss or present or have a conversation with that you may not have been able to do with other art yeah, well, from my personal experience, my first show was about me being a burn survivor and the accident that I had when I was, in, when I was 16. And I don't think I could have written that like as a, uh, maybe as a theatre piece, but I think it was just easiest to be open and share that side of me for an hour. And that, that's difficult for me to even share with my friends. Um, like that wound, and then I was okay to go about it. Like it became easier for me to talk to my friends about it because I've done this whole show and then, you know, it's like validated that experience so it no longer became like painful to talk about so I think it's yeah that was that was good and stand up because it is honest and I totally agree with Nikki that um, I only bring things to the stage that are true um, and I remember like doing a performance and this guy came up and he'd done this like hilarious story and I'm like I can't believe that happened and he said like oh no it didn't I just made it up oh. I was like <gasps> <laughs> Yeah, and from that day on, I was like, I don't want to make anything up like, that I say on stage, I want it to come from. Yeah, my truth. Um, yes, yeah, so I think it's, it's very liberating. I've always found that good stand up. Um, yeah. And I find the, um, I'm sorry to go back to Gatsby again, but like that, that process of taking something painful and making it into comedy. It's for me. It's an important part of processing. The yeah, thing that I find the same thing. When I write the comedy, I write all the pain out. Um, but then, when choosing which parts of that to bring, bring to stage, uh, then you make a choice of like the perspective that you take on it. So I don't find that. Yeah, I don't find that part of weakness. I find that strength in it. And I think that by performing um, comedically, it's given me the ability to talk about a lot of stuff which was too difficult to talk about. As I said, like there's things that put in front of audience I've never spoken about with a person. I'd never talk about it with someone. And sometimes I'll just be like, I'm going to talk about this tonight. I'm going to talk about this particular messed up experience um, that I had. And by constructing it as a, as a comedy show, it makes it something that I can share. It's not awkward to share it. Mm. Um, and you have an ownership over it. Yeah. Because you're choosing how you present it and the way that mm. you want to look at it. Yeah. yeah. And it's sort of, by wrapping something in comedy, it's not like imposing it on other people. Mm. That's why I always felt like talking about my identity, like, you know, people sitting around talking about sex and be like, yeah, well, I don't like that, I hate that, I think that's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> just like, you're sort of harsh and everyone's fine when you do that. Um, but like in comedy, just like, ha ha, how funny is this? Then it, you know, it enables people to understand it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Makes them want to listen to it, as yes. opposed to be like, whoa, what's your other I can very much relate to what Annie was saying regarding, um, <laughs> Also, like comedy creating a, um, uh, an avenue for communication in your personal relationships, mm. <laughs> yeah. um, which is very, is quite, is an absolute, like a, a side effect that I did not anticipate. Um, so, in my first solo show, Taranoia, um, primarily I was looking at um, my. Uh, my journey <laughs> with uh, anxiety and depression and uh, and treatment and uh, but particularly a large portion of the show was looking at the history of pathologizing women's mental health um, and hysteria and wandering womb and uh, all of those um, archaic ideas about uh, women's psychology and um, it was funny because a lot of a lot of that the narrative that I took uh, was um, peppered with you know my my own experiences um, uh, and a lot of those topics and experiences I had never discussed with my immediate family, for example. Um, and so it's 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 interesting because uh, one one thing I discussed was uh, you know for me uh, like anxiety uh, has also uh, 
contributed to sexual dysfunction. So, like, uh, uh, so you might be familiar with vulvodynia or uh, vaginismus, uh, which, um, particularly, you know, for those who don't know at, at home. Uh, <laughs> Vulvodynia involves like it's a it's a pain pain condition uh, which prevents uh, penetrative sex, um, and it can be incredibly uh, thank you so much. Um, it can be incredibly distressing and upsetting, and uh, and it's like a feedback loop of anxiety. And it <laughs> it's interesting uh, because me just talking about that experience and making light of it. Um, meant that I could have that conversation uh, with one particular family member who had themselves experienced it and we just never talked about it, we never knew. Um, and it turns out that it's, it's a history in my family. Um, and had I not uh, discussed that in my show, that would not have come to light. Um, and, and, but in particular, looking at kind of broader like mental health conversations, like those were things that my family didn't really talk about as much as I would say they do now, <laughs> um, but it, it does, and I think that that's that's um, just coming back to the the thing about things you you do or you, you find that you can talk about or you can't talk about. Um, yeah, I think that um, absolutely that was for me. It's actually been quite an interesting personal uh, journey that I I didn't anticipate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I, I, from my personal experience, I've also found like that transposition of the, the experience of the into material or into something else has can have like a sort of like yeah, it can help with things like closure or healing to have that mm. ability to like I'm going to take this shitty day or this awful relationship or this experience that could have been quite damaging and I can I can reframe it and I can work through it to create something out of it. And it, it also gives you the ability to examine your own perspective on it mm. because you're writing for an audience. And Absolutely. when you experience something like it, yeah, you tell mm. a story to yourself about it, which informs how you react to it emotionally. Mm. But when you go like, okay, I've got to present this to an audience, you need to examine your own feelings, your own behaviour, yep. the way you dealt with it yourself, and it just reframes our situation. Absolutely. Yeah. This is an interesting thought, and I know about you, mm. but. Sometimes I think because I've said a joke or told a story that same time so many times that it's altered my memory of that event. <gasps> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, yes. I've simplified it. And Absolutely. I'm like, maybe this isn't really what happened. And I, yeah, I've like, maybe manufactured a memory. Can I also just throw something in there? There's a story that I tell in Taranoia that's about um, kind of basically this, this bit of a meltdown I have when I come home and my partners hanging out with my housemate and uh, basically I just frame it to be like me having a really like at the, at, in, in the context it's me talking about how it's hard to be both a feminist and someone that's like also a little bit cray cray um, <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of like trying to challenge those ideas around women's mental health and stuff mm. and um, so I tell this story about how I just like run off in the middle of the night with my car and all my sleeping gear just because I witnessed my partner and my housemate like drinking beer and having fun and stuff. Um, and um, yeah, uh, <laughs> but it's funny because the way I tell that story is very much I'm the kind of I'm gonna say the not the villain of the story, but the way I tell it and have like progressed to tell it is that I'm I'm the butt of the joke, I suppose. Uh, you know, I, I don't really I don't give myself much more credit than that. Um, and I've had friend I have one particular friend who's come back to me. When I've just been telling that joke in a pub or something, or telling that story in a pub, and she says, "You know that, like, it didn't exactly happen that way. I remember you crying and calling me that night, and there was other things going on that, in, like, not to, not like, not to, like, pay out my partner or anything, like, or, or our friends, but there was a lot more going on in that moment um, that informed your response. And whilst you had like an ex a kind of extreme response, the way you tell that story p kind of paints you as like a really irrational person. Um, and I would agree. I think that there are there can be actually some possible damage in the way that we do kind of simplify our stories and if, if we haven't you know and as you say uh, Nikki if we haven't fully come full circle mm -hmm. on those stories if we haven't kind of come yeah. to a place of healing if they're still quite raw it can actually affect how we are processing those experiences for ourselves I think yeah so I would agree it's very easy to self-deprecate it is so easy <laughs> <laughs> and it creates a better on-stage persona sometimes when you do have a, there's always a slight persona, but you're like, oh, of course, I don't want to pay out all my friends and everyone I know, <laughs> so I'll make, I'll make myself the butt of the joke, but sometimes you shouldn't have been. Yeah, because yeah, oh, I've had sort of mixed experiences with that, I suppose, because in terms of going over 
my personal history, there's a lot of stuff which was suppressed or not spoken about. Um, and because I was in the closet for a long time, I knew I was trans when I was like 11. Um, so when I first looked up the word in the dictionary. Um, but I would always suppress it. And so there'd be experiences which I had, which I'm just was like, oh well, we shall never speak of this again. Mm. Um, and by telling those stories, it's actually brought a lot of my own history to, to light, mm. uh, which was stuff that, because you can, if you're in, um, if you're suppressing element of yourself, you can erase it from your own history of yourself. And so you remember selectively things and you create a story for yourself which is, <coughs> excuse me, which is like, which is not true, which is not accurate. Because um, you've only grabbed the bits which suit the story that people want yeah. to tell um, And so in terms of like going back over memory and pulling things back out and presenting things as I actually were, it's very powerful in terms of like giving myself a, a sense of what my life actually has been. And you can look at situations and be like, oh, that was like, this was not at all how this was presented at the time. Where I found that is um, sometimes it's changed. It's like a, there'll be a story I've told from memory. And be, I remember this as being like, you know, this, this funny thing. And I'll, mm. I'll make it a little bit funnier than it was yes. for the, for the um, thing. Um, and avoid that. Bit. But, um, like, I'll do that. But then I decided to think, I'm going to do some more research. I'm going to drag out my old diaries and I'll read them. Uh, and I'll, like, feed into that. Because, like, I've sort of, you know, gone into the, the remembering process. But then I read the diaries and I'm like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Like, because you read them with a new eye. Um, you read them from a modern perspective and you think, oh, that was really problematic, what that person did. Or something like that, like you'll see a situation and be like, this was not at all how, how like I remembered it, because it's only like looking at the actual facts of a situation with hindsight and with maturity um, reveal things differently. And so I've certainly had moments like that where I've gone, oh, the way I present this is this like how the story is not at all what it actually, actually was. But I'm going to keep presenting light out of what I'm saying. That can, that can go. <laughs> That's for another art form. <laughs> oh, God. But I guess in that way, um, your experiences with comedy have been a provocation to explore these things as well. Mm -hmm. So it can sort of, yeah. Um, I don't know, bring, it, br it brings a lot of stuff to light, I think. Yeah. yeah it may not, maybe, maybe not immediately, <laughs> Oh yeah. I've definitely found that through my own yeah, shows and things like that. Um, I wanted to uh, finish up with two, two questions because I think we've got just a couple of minutes left. Um, so the first one was, uh, we often say that you can only be what you can see, um, uh, which I think illustrates the fundamental importance of diversity and representation mm -hmm. everywhere. Yep. Um, but particularly, I wanted to ask you in comedy, are there diverse voices and sto or stories of diverse performers that really inspired you to begin? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I'm going to ask after that, but we'll ask that question first. But after that, I wanted to see if you had any advice for anyone who wants to start. Mm -hmm. so those are the two questions we're going to finish with. Um, but yeah. Yep. Um, growing up, I rented every single DVD on stand up in Blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I started. And like, yeah, it was mostly just, yeah, straight, cis white mm. guys. Um, I, yeah, the first show I ever went to was Jason Byrne, who's like the clowning guy, mm -hmm. and like that gave me such a buzz just seeing that as an art form. That like that night I was like 14 and I did not sleep. I was like, oh my god, like it's a thing. And, like you get paid for it. Um, and then I would say like now like the most inspirational people are like Bonnie Chang, like his journey, mm -hmm. like you know coming from an Asian background and like living in Melbourne, doing a TV show, and then getting picked up and going to Hollywood. Um, but like we have very different styles of comedy, and even now people are seeing Ali Wong and they're like trying to like compare, like, oh, she must inspire you, like yes, very much so. But we also have different styles. Like my comedy, I would say, is more like Judith Lucy, mm -hmm. so dry, like. <laughs> like what you look like and they try to compare you so then I think um, hopefully like now this like Asian wave is happening in like, mm. movies and comedy that like I can be at the forefront of that in Australia but it's still quite difficult like there's mm. not I, I'm friends with, like every other female Asian comedian in Australia <laughs> <laughs> we're all like championing each other and it's, it's so good um, but I feel like we have a lot of them so that people don't compare like us all mm. to each other. Like that's yeah. when you know that you've truly got diversity. Um, and 
hopefully like if I can stay in the game, some younger person is going to say like, oh, this is a thing that I can actually do and then yeah. they'll rise up as well. So that's been something that's kept me going, which is like just being part of it mm. um, and occupying that space means that somebody else can be inspired by that and go like, hmm, that's viable. Um, yeah, and uh, even if it sucks, like even if I'm doing really shit, I'm like, well, I'm here, like representing. So that's what keeps me, mm. yeah continuing to want to do it. Um, yeah, the next thing like barrier to practice like the TV and like more mainstream like radio and film kind of market is like we are all independent, like none of us are signed. And I was Oh yeah. Yeah. And I was like <laughs> browsing the token website, there's only two like main agencies and they're all white guys. Like I'm I'm like, oh there's Dilbert. That was it. That was like <laughs> the university. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> and they get all the jobs, there's like a real like, monopoly on all the TV and um, radio networks. So that means that um, doing these fringe festivals that we're all doing is really liberating because as long as like you can pay the registration fee and get a venue and there's grants and stuff as well, you can put on a show and invite your friends and that's, you're now a festival performer. Mm. So that's been so empowering for me, like doing whatever you can, like building a website, getting business cards made, um, that say that you know I'm legit legitimately a comedian. It doesn't require someone else to like date me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there is that thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I was when I was a teenager, there was like there was no queer content anyway. No queer content, and it was suspicious to even go looking for it or know about it. There used to be this late like game show, Sticky Moments, by a guy called Julian Clary. Um, the a gay comedian in, in the UK. And so I'd start late at night and I'd watch this, like, this gay game show. Um, and it was, it was really empowering to see a queer person being queer um, and using humour to make it okay. And so like, people, like, people wouldn't watch Julian Cleary and like, hate him for being gay. Um, <coughs> and they'd watch him and love him for being funny. And that was really inspiring for me at the time. Um, so I made it like rather boldly started making a lot of queer jokes at, <laughs> at school um, in my conservative hometown in rural Queensland. <laughs> um, I was just like, oh no, 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 I can, we can joke about this. We can joke about having sex and then let's go. Um, <coughs> so um, when I came to, um, when I came to doing my own comedy world, there, I didn't have any reference to my own identity. Um, I sort of I knew there was one asexual stand-up who I knew about, Janine Garofalo. Um, it was like it was seeing her comedy or seeing her do an interview, which made me look up asexuality and realise that that was me. Um, so she was one, but there were very few people talking about asexuality um, or doing like I, I had never seen a whole show just about it, um, and there weren't very many like transgender comedians uh, around either. Um, but I sort of looked at you know the history of um, gay comedy and lesbian comedy, which has changed the way people um, the way people view those identities and increased the acceptability of those identities within society. I'm just like, well, we need more of us doing that. We need more aspect, We need more trans people um, doing that. So I sort of needed to draw like inspiration from like other examples of, of diversity. I also found yeah that that experience I've had being a critic and seeing the number of female comedians who are really good um, and not spoken about as much, um, unless you've got a feminist editor who sends you out to like um, cover them all, um, but you know, n not getting the same attention in the mainstream press. Like if you like, if you look at the mainstream press, it looks like it's all like straight cis white guys. Mm -hmm. But if you're actually out there seeing the comedy that's happening, mm -hmm. there is a lot more diversity. And seeing especially um, how the young female comics were just a lot more creative, a lot more adventurous, a lot more truthful in their comedy uh, than what was presented to you as a stand-up. Um, that was also very inspiring as well. Um, everyone knows performer Andy Smelling, um, who's just mm. fun at Fringe. Like, her first solo show really like lit a fire under me because she did this thing which was like comedy and storytelling mm. and physical performance. It's this whole mashup. I thought it was very Andy. And I'm like, yeah, this is what I want. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so it's performers like that who have their own like, um, like really unique style, and just like yeah, this is something you would never see, a, you know, some straight guy do this show. Um, this is a completely different, different style of art, and I found that those sort of shows very inspiring. Mm. 
Um, I, I think for me, I didn't quite... Uh, I didn't specifically see uh, comedians who I kind of aspired to be until I was actually performing, mm -hmm. uh, like in my first comedy festival, um, and I didn't, I hadn't really understood th that it meant so much to me until I'd actually um, found myself in the same spaces uh, as some of these people that I have now come to admire <laughs> um, quite profoundly, um, because I came from my, my biggest inspirations uh, when I was in my teenage years were like punk rock bands mm -hmm. who were overwhelmingly white dudes um, and even and even when I kind of started cutting my teeth on musical comedy um, you know the biggest names in musical comedy are like Tim Minchin and Bill Bailey um, I, I, I step, it was a kind of my mission to I suppose um, when, I, when I started to see this this gap in representation <laughs> the, which is which goes so much further than simply like cis white women like me um, but you know they are out there <laughs> people of other identities that are doing it but but it's 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 not as um, it's kind of even worse for musical comedy in a sense because musical comedy is also almost a kind of maligned art form in itself like it's like not as you know it's it's it doesn't it's not, I'm not like what was me but it's just it's interesting how people respond to musical comedy as opposed to stand up um, and um, uh, for reasons um, and um, <laughs> But, but, you know, there are some incredible uh, female musical comedians. You might have heard of uh, Garfunkel and Oates or uh, Rachel Bloom of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend fame. Um, and those are people that, that, I, that I reach for inspiration from now. Um, but I will be honest, the, big, like, the people that inspire me the most are the people that I have the opportunity to to kind of uh, know now, and those are folks like um, Fringe Wives Club, um, Tessa Waters, um, Victoria Falconer, and um, uh, and um, Roe Hudson, and and others, um, and uh, and also uh, probably one of my biggest inspirations is an incredible artist called Jude Pearl, who um, uh, <laughs> who if you haven't heard of her, please please pursue that, um, and she's someone who. I shouldn't have access to, but I do. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, but for me, I, it's, it's interesting because I, I didn't necessarily kind of develop with, with these people in my vision, um, but it's now I feel so grateful to be able to, and I mean, these incredible women here as well um, are just constant sources of inspiration for me as well. So um, yeah, I think I covered that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being part of the panel. I guess my final question that I just wanted to finish off with Michael Brown, if there's one thing that you might tell someone who wants to be a comedian, inspiring comedian, is there anything that you would advise your kids? Try it. Get, get into it and they say you'll either hate it or get addicted. So, yeah. yeah. And you won't know until you try it. You won't know until you try it, yes. Um, I would say don't believe any stories people tell you about the path to do it. Mm. People tell you a lot of lies about it. Mm. Um, there's, we come from a particular culture in comedy, like the geek peak culture, where everyone goes like, you're supposed to do like open mic, open mic, open mic, and build up. I didn't do it that way. No. I just did a solo show. Yep. Um, <laughs> expanding into open mics yep. um, now to try to like make them a bit more queer. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I needed to be a strong comedian before I could go into that environment. Um, for myself personally, so it's like, and that's a perfectly legit way of doing it. You don't need to go that route. You can go by the internet first, just have your own private YouTube channel if you want. But you don't need to do that mm. either, you don't need to do anything. You just need to find your, um, your own path through it. And it's the same with the comedy that you do. People will tell you, like, also a lot of lies about that. Like, oh, you have to make people laugh in the first so many seconds. Start off by making a joke about how you look to the audience, get them on side, mm. it's all crap. <laughs> It's it's all crap. A lot of people don't really know how to um, how to analyse comedy. They don't know how to talk about comedy, even though they're putting themselves up as comedians. And, you, know. <laughs> um, you don't need to be super funny to be a comedian. You just need to be interesting. Yeah. As long as you're interesting on stage, the audience will watch you, and the jokes will come, and the humour will come. Um, the most important thing is just to be authentically yourself. Yeah. In your time. Yeah, <laughs> um, I was gonna say, absolutely. I was gonna, I was gonna say. I, I think when you do bring just uh, your your authentic self to the table, I think a lot of people are surprisingly charming. Uh, 
and I think there's something about putting a mic in front of yourself that, mm. that does give you this uh, kind of power. Uh, and I think, you know, like there's, there's a lot to be said for the freedom of, of open mic. There's a lot to be said for that. But, but comedy is surprisingly open access. Like, <laughs> there's a lot of. Anyway, yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to. Okay. You pay the money and you can do it free. Yeah, like anyone. <laughs> people don't know this because people will say, oh my God, you got a comedy festival show. I know, they like, act like it's all curated. Yeah, yeah. I'll just, I, yeah I want the special, huh? <laughs> Um, yeah, but I, I think that I think that there is there is a lot to be said that uh, that every gig is different as well. Um, so you can feel, you know, I think just just be have a support network around you. And I think that pursuing relationships is really important as well. I think it is is as much important that you're trialing material and that you're giving it a crack on stage as you as it is hanging out with folks at the bar, uh, you know, and and just kind of you know um, just. Just trying to create those relationships because ultimately that's what that's what will support you and and kind of carry you through and really motivate you as well um, mm. yeah. to to keep going as well because mm. you know I think if we didn't have like debriefs and stuff yeah. like you know it would be a lot harder it'd be a lot harder um, it's a shared experience in that regard yeah. yeah. It's amazing you do like I reckon every ten gigs I do a mom. So yeah. Like, but we still do it. Only so one in it. ten. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that's after like so many years of experience. Yep. It's about like bearable suffering for you. Like what are you really? Because <laughs> <laughs> like when I have this connection with the audience, it feels oh. like there's this light like shining and everyone's feeding off it. Nothing else has been ever. I try and say bring a friend as well. If yeah. you can just bring a friend, one friend to every gig, then you got someone in your corner and you're like. Because <laughs> <laughs> I always, I always love. I recommend performing. Adelaide because yeah. Adelaide's. Right. Right. <laughs> sorry, Nikki. Sorry. You know, I, I enjoy, I enjoy every, like most performances I do. Yeah. Um, I don't enjoy producing. It's like every time I produce a show, I'm like, this is the last. <laughs> yeah. Never again. Um, but it happens again. And then it happens like, again. Even as I'm saying like, never again, this. I'm paying the rego on the next yeah. festival. Yeah. Um, this is true. It happens, like, there's a, uh, a saying we have in improv, which is follow the fun. <laughs> like when you're on stage and you're improvising, and it can go anywhere. So you just pick the funnest thing in a scene. Don't do the thing which you're like, the scene might be pushing you one way, but it's like, this was the funny bit, this was the shiny bit, and you follow that, and then you'll have a good show. And it's the same, I think, with, with life and careers as well, like, which parts are fulfilling you, which parts are giving you mm. enjoyment. Mm. Follow those shiny things, whatever they are, and um, they'll take you to where you want to go. I could not possibly top that. <laughs> Applause for our amazing panel, Annie Louie, Nikki Bennett, and, and our incredible host, Elizabeth Davis. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, as I understand, there's another three days of events with the Amazing Creative Women uh, Conference. And um, thank, we'd like to thank RMIT so much for helping us put this on. Yeah. Thank you. Cool.